What's going on guys? Welcome back to Pat Outdoors. I'm gonna take this downtime to redo some of my projects. Some of my bikes, such as this black Razor MX650. So I'm gonna be stripping this thing back down to bare frame, kind of like how I did my blue bike. My whole goal with this one is to have a second streetable bike for my wife or some friends to use so that they can join me on some of these rides. What I'm going to do now is start cutting off any excess tabs and material. Any of these pieces of metal that we're no longer going to use. I might cut these off as well and flatten these sections down to make more room for the battery. And then we're going to start prepping the frame and the swing arm for paint. All right guys, before we proceed with the painting portion of this project, I just wanna remind you for safety purposes that if you are gonna to try to do anything like this at home to get yourself a respirator at least that is designed for this so that you don't inhale anything toxic. If you are interested in checking out any of the items or parts that we are using for today's project, I will leave a link in the description where you can get everything. And here's how we're looking so far. This is just a coat of self etching primer. So we have a nice smooth, fresh surface that promotes adhesion for the base coat.
I chose to go with a bright orange finish to kind of give it a KTM themed look. I laid it down pretty thick to ensure it gets a glossy finish. I think it's gonna look pretty good combined with this gloss black swing arm. And for the rear shock, I'm gonna be using this one by DNM. It's 165 millimeters long. This was on my first MX650 before I switched over to the 190 adjustable on that one. This is more ideal for street use, not so much off-road. It is a higher spring rate. This is 750 pounds. It's more ideal for heavier riders like myself. I'm 180 pounds right now. If you are a lot lighter, I would consider a much softer spring rate. This shock actually gives the back of the bike about an inch and a half lift if you mount it on this lower mounting point on the swing arm. And for the fork, I'm gonna be using this original one that came off of my 72 volt MX650. I purchased this brand new last year, so this has very little use on it. I swapped over to an Alter Ego fork and pit bike brake. This one's got the Zoom hydraulic mountain bike brake already installed on it. So we're gonna combine that with a 160 mil rotor for the front. And for the motor, I'm gonna be using this MY1020 motor that came with my Weber 48 volt brushless kit. And for the handlebar, I'm just using a factory one with a Pro Taper 8.6 inch bar pad. And I'm gonna pair that with this Electro & Co twist throttle that has a built-in three-speed controller. And it also has Pro Taper grips already installed. Should pair nicely. The first step for refinishing these stock wheels is to remove the valve stem cores and let all the air out. And then I broke the bead on both wheels with some tire spoons just to make enough space to be able to mask around the wheels. I'm gonna try out this new trick that I saw on TikTok for a quick masking for these type of wheels. I'll show you in a minute. So gonna take off the rotor and the sprocket so we have more access. Start sanding everything down and prepping it for paint. All right, let's see if this actually works. You're supposed to take a section of plastic, kind of like a square, and lay it on top. Get an idea where the center is. You grab it from the center, and cut about an inch short of the center, the radius. So it fits tight around the wheel. 
which in theory would cut a perfect circle in the center, which it does. Let's see if it tucks in nicely around the edges. Looks to be working. Wow, that actually worked. Perfectly wrapped around the whole rim. Here, just to give you guys a close up view, it is tucked nicely between the tire and the rim. We are ready for paint. And here's how the wheels look after curing overnight. It's nice and glossy. I think it looks amazing considering it's spray paint. Now it's time to take off the masking tape, reinstall the rotors, the sprocket, and put them back on the bike. Should be my ignition switch with the built-in voltmeter. So here's what it looks like. It looks very similar to the one on Electro and Co's website, except I got this one off Amazon for like $14, I think. Came with two keys, three wire connector, so it should be pretty simple to wire up. Here's how everything looks on the top side. Got the light switch here, three speed controller on the ENC throttle. And then this is the, we're not gonna see the voltmeter feature until I have the controller and stuff hooked up. And here's the ignition. Got all the cables and wiring passing through the front number plate. Here's what it looks like on the back side. It all just goes through this one hole that's under the Nylite LED headlight that we just installed. And in case you're curious, this is a 12 volt meant for a car, but I've got a voltage step down converter that converts anywhere from 48 to 72 volts to a 12 volt output. So I've just got that wired in line. So this goes to your battery power source. So 72 volts in ground, 72 volts goes in and 12 volts goes out, passes through a 10 amp inline fuse. I'm gonna clean this up a little bit more. I just wanna show you how that works, how you wire up 12 volt accessories. Also installed just a stock rear brake caliper from my MX650 when that was new. I barely used this one. So we might as well use something newer. So I'm gonna wire this up to the battery just to test it out so I can show you guys how bright this thing is. Well, should definitely be plenty for night riding.
thing I'm gonna do is add a layer of this three quarter inch thick dense foam to the bottom battery tray and the inside of the frame just for added protection for the lithium battery pack. And here's how that looks like. This just helps absorb any sort of vibrations from impact whenever you're off-roading or hitting bumps on the road to protect the battery and the electronics since this is usually the most expensive part of these type of builds. Here's the battery pack that I'm using for this bike. It's by Cal MM, which is a Chinese company. These type of batteries aren't usually the most ideal choice if you're looking for absolute max power. I chose to go with this one because of the 50 amp BMS. It's also got a built-in 12 volt output USB port, so I can hook up additional lighting or charge my phone whenever I'm riding my bike. Here's a general idea of how I'm gonna have the battery sit in the frame. The dimensions are a little long. I wish it was more of a cube style that sits flat on the bottom battery tray, like the one on my 72 volt bike, but this should work just fine since the width is exactly the same as the inside of my side covers when they're installed on the bike. So that's gonna keep it from moving around. This is everything that we're gonna be using for today's project. Just some standard wire strippers, crimpers, open barrel terminal type crimpers. This is what we're gonna be using to install the pins for the Kelly connectors. Some multi-packs of different style wire connectors, heat shrink tubing, and some electrical tape to clean up the wiring when we're all done. Here's the pigtail connector for the battery. And here's the Kelly controller that's been pre-programmed by Electra & Co. This is the brains of the bike. This is what's going to replace this standard style 33 amp brushless controller that originally came with the kit. This is what draws the power from the battery and delivers it to the motor. And this is what made the biggest change in top speed for my 72 volt bike. It's definitely very important to have a good quality controller. So I'm excited for this. And then this is just a rough wiring diagram that I drafted for myself to use as a guideline for my first Kelly controller install video. I used to be intimidated by wiring these things before, but I realized after reviewing some factory diagrams that they work pretty much the same as any other brushless controller. It just laid out a little differently. So all of the wires coming out of the Kelly controller are actually color coded and they're numbered. So it's hard to get this wrong as long as you carefully follow the diagrams they have available online. And then this four pin connector goes to a Bluetooth dongle. So if you have an Android device and you wanna do further tuning, you can do that. These three posts on the center of the controller are for the face wires for the MY1020 motor. It doesn't matter if you have a Kunray or a Vever, most of these brushless motors have the same thing. Three face wires, blue, yellow, and green, goes to blue, yellow, and green. And then this six pin connector coming out of it with the five wires. This is for the hall sensors. This will go to the similarly designed six pin connector on the Kelly controller. Though the design's a little different, so you have to replace this connector with a six pin one that's provided by Kelly, so it matches perfectly. Then the red post and the black post are just for the battery positive and negative, which will just go to this connector. First thing I did to the motor wiring was cut off all the old plugs. And then I installed these three ring stock connectors. These are 12 to 14 gauge for the phase wires. And then I slid on these silicone grommets and crimped on the pins that came with the Kelly controller. Then we're gonna take these five wires. We're gonna insert them to the back side of the six pin Kelly connector. And then we're gonna lock them in place with this yellow piece. So it looks something like this. And then we're gonna slide the grommets through the back side to keep them insulated. Now these are all the wires coming out of the 1020 motor. We've already determined that the three phase wires just go in the th top three posts on the controller. And then the other five wires, which are these hull sensor wires, hook up to the six pin connector on the Kelly. And from my research, black on the motor side goes to black on the controller, which is number 21. Red on the motor goes to purple on the controller, which is number five. Yellow on the motor goes to green on the controller, which is number 17. 
Green on the motor goes to blue on the connector, which is number 16, and blue on the motor side goes to yellow on the controller, which is number 18. And I'm referring to these numbers. Now let's go pin this up. And this is how the connector looks all assembled. Now we just gotta do this to the other two. Now it's time to wire up the ignition switch with the voltmeter and the throttle with the speed controller. The switch should be pretty easy. It's only three wires. Black is ground, red is power in, and green is power out. All this does is when you turn the key on, it completes the circuit between green and red. And then when you turn it off, it breaks the circuit between the two wires. So the red is gonna hook up to a power source, in this case, the positive on the battery. And then green is gonna go to the signal wire that turns the controller on when you turn the key on. And then the six wires that are coming out of the throttle. I don't know why this says that the ground is white, but it's definitely black. But the red wire is for five volts, the green is for the throttle signal, and for the speed switch, blue is for low speed, yellow is the ground, and brown is for high speed. And for the ignition lock switch, it's gonna hook up directly to the positive on the battery. And then when you switch it on, it's gonna supply power to number seven, which is the pink wire. And for the throttle, five volt hooks up to number four, throttle signal goes to three, and the ground goes to 20. And last for the three speed switch, the ground hooks up to number six, and then low speed hooks up to number 22, and high speed hooks up to number 12. Here's how the rest of the plugs ended up looking like. The nine pin male connector has the three throttle wires and then the nine pin female connector has the three speed controller wires along with the green signal wire from the ignition switch. And then the ground and power source are gonna hook up to the top post on the controller. And here's how I have everything hooked up. It's not permanently mounted yet. I just got it mocked up for testing. I got the voltage step down converter teed off of the power source. So we can power up the headlight. Everything else is 52 volts. All the connectors plugged up nicely. Fifty four point eight volts, fifty four point nine. It's relatively full charge. I think this battery, when it's fully, fully charged, settles at around fifty six. Definitely peppy. And here's how the side panels ended up looking like installed back on the bike. With how I had it previously installed, I just had it zip tied in place since I couldn't fully get the bolts on, but this time I was able to get both covers on nice and flush against the frame, which sandwiches the battery in place. Here's how I have the USB port. I just have it tied to the other cables with enough slack. I wanted it easily accessible in case I wanna charge my phone while I'm riding. I cut a little slot for it. And then here's the charge port for the battery, which I previously installed on an earlier video, but turned out pretty clean. I really like how the CRF50 plastics look on these type of bikes, though the plastics on my 72 volt bike look noticeably better just because of the tighter tolerances around the edges, it's just a matter of a manufacturing difference. Since we are riding this bike on the street, for safety purposes, I added a adjustable mirror on the handlebar so we can see if there's a car coming up behind us. If you are interested in checking out any of the parts that we're using for this whole project, I will leave everything linked in the description below in case you want to check it out. And so we can measure speed. I added a GPS-based speedometer that has a odometer feature, a couple of you guys recommended. I really like this one because there's no wiring involved. It takes a minute to install it. So I got myself a Bluetooth module from Electro & Co. So we can at least connect to the Kelly controller 
and check out the settings, see what changes we can make to the tune to make it a little less limited, or just at least diagnose, see what's going on with the bike. And then I just got a refurbished Samsung tablet since these Bluetooth modules or dongles only work with Android devices. And then I just got a 15 tooth sprocket in case we can't get any more RPMs out of the motor. We were replacing my 13 tooth with a 15 tooth so we can at least get more rotation out of the rear wheel to get us closer to that higher top speed. Now this is not a recommendation since this is gonna put a lot of load on the MY1020 motors, especially if you're going uphill. This is simply for experiment. Hopefully we can get that 40. Luckily I have my Kelly controller installed above the battery. So it's easy for me to access this four pin connector. And then the Bluetooth dongle simply just clips onto it. Now let's go over the software that we're gonna be using to make some changes on the Kelly. I already downloaded it ahead of time. It's called DC Adjuster. We're just gonna open that up. Do not twist the throttle or try to run your bike whenever you have this app open and connected to the Kelly controller. All right, so let's key on. Plus, yes, continue, Bluetooth. You'll see that the Bluetooth dongle is flashing when it's keyed on. That does not mean it's connected. Then we're gonna click connect here. I already connected to this and paired it with Bluetooth on this tablet. So it comes up HCO6. All right, now it says connected. You'll notice that the Bluetooth dongle stopped flashing. Now we're gonna click read. It'll pick up the data. Now I just wanna make this very clear. I'm not a tuner, I'm not a professional. So please don't ask me what settings you should have on your bike. I'm just simply a dude on the internet sharing what I'm doing with mine as an experiment. One thing I am gonna do is I'm gonna change the max current per from 33 to 40. Again, this is an experiment. Please do not do this to your bike. I'm gonna click right, which should program the controller. It says data writing is complete. So we're just gonna check that again. Read, it saved as 40. Looks like we are all set. Now I'm gonna swap out the sprocket from a 13 tooth to a 15 tooth. Hopefully I don't need to extend the chain. So all you need for something like this is just a 10 mil and a 12 mil. The 10 mil is to hold the shaft in place and the 12 mil is gonna break this nut loose. What's interesting about these is it is reverse thread. So you turn clockwise in order to loosen it. There's still enough slack in the chain. It's not wound up too tight, so I don't need to extend it. Again, it is counterclockwise to tighten it. There it is. 58 volts, charged enough. GPS is working now. Thirty-nine point one miles an hour. I can't believe we're less than one mile an hour short. <laughs> 